I'm Deborah Herman, and this is my husband, uh, Jeff Herman, and we are uh, kind of a, an industry publishing team from um, all sides. Uh, Jeff is a literary agent, and he's uh, been one for many years. He also, um, it's a, we specialize in nonfiction, and for many years I worked with the agency uh, screening and curating and looking at the things we're going to talk about today, which are um, submissions, book proposals, and kind of getting inside the head of um, literary agents and editors and, and what they look for, because you can, there's a big threshold that a new writer needs to um, overcome in order to be published today. And many, uh, Jeff can talk a little bit more about this, the state of publishing today, but it's difficult, but not impossible to obtain a traditional publishing contract. Um, but what you wanna do is try to eliminate all of the possibilities that will have you rejected offhand without even going deeper into what your project is. So that's what we really wanna talk about today. Um, so Jeff, um, you're, a, you're a literary agent. So you've looked at, I mean, I've looked at thousands of query letters and proposals, but you've sold thousands to the traditional publishers. When you first look at, um, a submission, let's say it's a letter. How do you go about assessing whether or not it's something that you want to represent and, and explain the role of a literary agent? Okay. Well, the, uh, the literary agent, uh, the, the short spiel for that is uh, we are the funnel uh, to the traditional publishers. The traditional publishers uh, are not eager uh, to receive unsolicited, what's known as unsolicited submissions. Uh, from the general writing public. And there are good reasons for that. They would just be flooded uh, be beyond repair if that were to happen. There, there's no infrastructure for, for that kind of screening process. So basically they rely upon the literary agents to do that screening for them and then to pitch to them projects that the agents have carefully vetted and feel that uh, are at least eligible for publication by the publishers. It doesn't mean just because the agent says you should publish this, that it'll get published, but at least it will get what I call access and quality consideration by the editors, which is what you need obviously to go to the next step, which is acquisition. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if writers understand how many submissions there really are um, each week to an agent or an editor. Nowadays, so much of it's done digitally, but back when we were starting out, it was a physical letter that you would receive if it was done in a query letter, or people would send unsolicited manuscripts, big boxes of these uh, full 300, 400 page manuscripts, where we had a closet dedicated we called it ye old slush room and it was filled to the brim. We would have, I mean, the post, the, the postal person hated us because they would literally come in with these, you know, right. Mm -hmm. They'd have these like sacks. So that's just a small number of thinking about how many people are making these submissions, wanting to get the few available spots with a literary agent or with an editor. So, there are things because, and Jeff will explain this further, but because literary agents work on commission, they have to, their time is so valuable that they have to immediately make decisions on what they're even going to consider or look further. And, uh, you know, that's, that's really what you can control as a writer. There are so many things you can't control, but there are certain things you can control. So for example, Jeff, when you first get, um, now it's an e-submission, but when you first get a submission, what's the first thing that will immediately, let's say, turn you off? Okay, well, the process is very intuitive. Uh, if, if anything that you've been doing for a long time, it, it becomes intuitive. 
And so my first goal is if I find myself having to intellectually contemplate what is in this letter, uh, that's a problem because it, 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 it's straining me. If I can, and I think yeah, like I'm speaking not, for I, my colleagues when, when I say course. that. Of course, we've had letters where we don't know what the book is about after reading it. Is that what you're talking about? That and just the concept of the, and then there are common errors that are made uh, innocently uh, by people generally who could be, they could be geniuses. They just don't really understand marketing and business. I would, that would be my hunch about what the issue is, but they'll start off by telling me in the letter how many rejections they've already received. They'll start telling me for how many years they've been getting those rejections. And then they will express their, their hope, uh, their prayer that this might be this might be a different experience for them, you know. But I mean, think about yourself. You know, you're going to a car dealer, and the car dealer is telling you, "Well, here's one model that nobody ever wants to buy. Here's another model that no, you know." It obviously uh, is is an unfortunate way. Or think about dating. You know, it's like the first rule, uh, which we haven't, of course, done in many, many, many years. But, but that we know of. that we know. But um, you know, you go on a date, or you're meeting a new person, or you have a business dinner, or something. You're not going to want to start out saying, you know, all of your woes and how nobody likes you and you're terrible and they all hate you. That's just not a good. It's not a good image to portray. And we we've gotten letters like that. So, what would be another thing that immediately uh, the person treats the the letter almost like they're a pen pal. And they will become very verbose about personal matters or experiences that are really not relevant uh, to the project or the industry. <laughs> or, you know, the point is to monetize this transaction. Uh, so if the point of the transaction is buried uh, somewhere in that letter, uh, that, that's a problem. And that becomes a lot of labor. Uh, Do you mind familiarity in... Um, if somebody's writing a letter, like like I, I've joked in the past, you know, where we used to get gifts and, you know, different ways that people might contact us. And I know sometimes we'll get a referral or name dropping, but sometimes if somebody's like trying to be a little familiar, how does that strike you? Well, if it's in the context of flattery, uh, especially in the first paragraph, I think it's an excellent idea. I mean, very few of my colleagues will admit that the way to get their attention is to start out the pitch letter by saying how impressed you are by their track record and how you've heard great things about them and how, you know, they you're you're one of their choices. You know, I mean, uh, the point is, if I start reading that, uh, I've obviously am paying very close attention, uh, even though uh, there's a part of me that knows you're being very servile. Uh, that's OK. But they shouldn't go as far as, you know, I don't know. It can sound kind of stalkery. <laughs> well, we, we, in, in Jeff's book, um, the I don't know if I have a copy here, but Jeff puts out a book every year, every couple of years, uh, Jeff Herman's Guide to Book Publishers, Editors, and Literary Agents. And he surveys agents uh, about some personal things. So there is a way for a person writing to an agent to have something personal, but again, everything in moderation and you want to sound professional and you don't, you don't want to sound uh, creepy. Um, but so you that's, want to get attention. You're right. You want to get attention. And, and when you're looking at um, a project, because there are so there's really statistically how many how many books do you actually take on? Now you're you're an experienced longtime agent. There may be agencies that that take on more projects, and but for you, what's the statistical rate? Well, I've uh, spoken to my colleagues, uh, hundreds of them over the years, and of course, I have my own experience. So none of us have scientifically clocked it, but we all. Uh, seem to be around the one or two percent of what we receive uh, goes on to representation. And just because we're representing it doesn't mean that we ultimately sell it. Most of us have a, you know, are, are fortunate if we go 50 
percent of what we're representing that we actually sell uh, to a publisher. Uh, not that the other 50% aren't eligible. It's just that there's many reasons why that would happen in a given point of time. But uh, yeah, so we're rejecting on average about 98% of what we see. Uh, starting, and that includes the pitch letter stage. The, uh, that doesn't, there are many projects I'll reject that my colleagues will happily not reject and, and vice versa. We're all very individual and we're not following the same script. Uh, this is a very human, very subjective uh, process, which is nice. I mean, we are the complete opposite of AI. We're doing it the way we're using the same technology that would have been used a hundred years ago. We're using what we think. <laughs> and and something that you resonate with and know that you can sell, it's like the so-called Jeff Herman book, uh, somebody else may have much more sensibility for novels, for high fantasy, things like that. And that's why in your book, you've tried to drill down to what these agents prefer to represent. Because if you can connect with that and find the right agent for the right project that's something that you're passionate about you don't want to try to conform your writing to what you think they want but if you find the right match you have a, a greater chance of uh, a represent a representative and also a successful representation yeah it's good to do some research yeah uh which you can do of course from the jeff herman's guide and or you can also just go and i tell people to do this anyway uh, is to go to the websites of each of the agencies, see if they've written uh, blogs or if they express in, in an explicit way what what not to send them, what not to bother. And you really want to listen to that. It's kind of like with any human relationship. If somebody tells you who they are, you really ought to listen. If an agent or or if a publisher says, I don't want this kind of material, it's it's going to cause you to be dismissed out of hand if you send them that kind of material. Yeah, that's almost more important than what they say they are looking for, because I would say you can send them things that weren't necessarily on that list of what they said they're not looking for, because they may not know that they're looking for it until they see it. But if they tell you right off the bat, I really don't want to look at that, you, you should it's you know, take their word for it. It's It's really a waste. And, uh, you know, you you can also do the old fashioned thing that that we used to recommend before there was so much access to the Internet. And that is the books that you like that are similar to the book you're writing. Look in the acknowledgments, see who the agents are and look at who's publishing that kind of work. Now, maybe that that they're full with that particular genre. Yeah, the or acknowledgment type of book. section uh, most of the time. The agent will be acknowledged by the published author in the acknowledgement section. And if that's in a category, a genre that you are writing, uh, you know, and the book wasn't published 50 years ago, uh, you, you clearly have now uh, a, a contact and you even have something you could put in that first sentence uh, complimenting that agent for uh, being the agent of that book. So let's get past the obvious where you want to match genre subject with the right agent i find that when we get further and people um you well i i recommend that nobody ever send a proposal or manuscript without being asked correct well that's one of the so-called rules but all of these rules in publishing are made to be broken uh and the rules do slowly shift so the point is, yeah, we all want to tell people not just to send a manuscript cold uh, because who wants to get cluttered, whether it's digital or, or material. Uh, however, people may do it anyway, and the agent may take a look at it anyway and say, oh, I want to represent this. So <laughs> it can work. I'm not saying it's out, of the, it's out of the ballpark. I'm just saying it's really an agent's preference just so that they don't yeah. get uh, overwhelmed with submissions that are blind. True. So as far as then, well, one thing I always like to tell people from remembering when I was uh, screening the query letters is you wanna make sure that whatever is gonna be the next step, 
you have it ready and available. Because when I was screening, I might find something in a query letter that I really liked. And I might want to contact that person. I might want to email that person. And so you always want to make yourself available. You want to include all your contact information, but you also want to have that next piece done. For example, if the next step would be a book proposal, which is the uh, what the the art form is for publishing, especially nonfiction, and you're writing to us, don't just write to us because you want to figure out if we like that kind of book, because there aren't that many of us and we have very long memories. So if we like it, then we'll say, well, we want to see it. You really need to have it ready and send it right away because you may not get another chance. Yeah, uh, the, the submission process should not be used as a test market for what you want to write next. We won't like that. <laughs> we'll remember you. Um, so then the person, we re request a book proposal. Again, fiction and nonfiction are very different. With fiction, a an agent dedicated to fiction will often ask for the first 50 pages, and you'll want to make sure they're polished and ready to go. Uh, you'll want to have a really good synopsis, and you don't want to when you're submitting to an agent with fiction, you don't want to have a synopsis that says, oh, but you'll have to you know, ask for more, or I'm not going to tell you the ending. You want to give them everything because they're the ones deciding if they want to purchase your book. But if we get back to nonfiction, um, you know, we've, we've written, this is now the third edition of this book, Write the Perfect Book Proposal, which <laughs> stemmed from me writing really bad book proposals at first. <laughs> and then we kind of developed this technique and it and it's worked and it, in many ways it changed how people were submitting their work um maybe explain the value of a book proposal well it's basically a like a business proposal uh if you're writing nonfiction, but one of the really nice things about nonfiction is you don't have to write the manuscript in order to get an agent and in order to get a book publishing contract. It could be done on the basis of a strong book proposal and maybe depending on the subject, uh, one or two chapters and sometimes zero chapters if it's a certain kind of book and you've developed a really good outline. And so there's a protocol that has existed basically the same way for at least 50 years, if not longer. Uh, certain uh, ingredients that go in the proposal have shifted because now there's so much more emphasis, emphasis on digital platforms, which, which is a, an overused and distorted uh, term, in my opinion, because I've seen the transition. But a lot of my uh, younger colleagues, they weren't part of this transition. Uh, they, they only came into the business when it was, when, it, when marketing already was very entrenched uh, in a digital way, in a digital fashion. Well, and not only digital platforms, I find that um, embracing the digital world for most authors nowadays is going to level the playing field because it used to be, well, it really started when all of the publishing houses became conglomerates and they had a higher threshold to meet in terms of what they could acquire. And it was remodeled. Yeah. And before that, you were able to sell books that are really great books, but they were considered, I guess, what's called the mid list. Exactly. Yeah. The industry has been restructured over the past 20 years in ways that I find uninteresting. Yeah, uh, really? Because what happened was the publishing industry in itself was very similar to the agenting uh, sector. You had a lot of mom and pop publishers. Uh, there were uh, dozens of very viable seven-figure, uh, eight-figure firms that I, were that I was dealing with, which were privately owned uh, by family, sometimes for generations. And they had names you would have heard of that it still exists today, such as Knopf or, or Scribner, et cetera. There, there were more than 100 of them. Uh, what's happened over the last 20 years is they, as the uh, owners and founders aged out, these assets, these publishing assets, and the goodwill that came with the brand name have been cons rolled up and consolidated by about four or five, actually five now, uh, massive media conglomerations. 
for which the book publishing division is about this important as far as monetary revenue flow, but a very good uh, source of content, which they can then spin into other forms of entertainment. And also, uh, this this was somewhat disastrous because the way it was when I was first entering um, the industry, I remember that the editors would have what what in the film business they call tentpole. They'd have to acquire some really big books that they that could um, be what's called front list, big major, you know, whoop de doo type of of title, but they had room for new authors, for books that were based on the, the content, the subject. They still do that, but they're not given as many opportunities as they had um, when there were more of these, in, uh, of these independently owned uh, publishing houses. So the threshold for getting a contract with one of the big five is pretty high. The book that you submit to them, they often are looking to have you um, able to sell 20,000 in the first printing. That's a lot of books. Uh, so, you know, that, it, but I don't, I don't want to make this seem like there are no opportunities for authors because that's what an author wants. They want to be published and they want to have their name on a book. They want their book distributed and they'd like a bestseller. So what, what is it like now and how can how can new writers or even you know people with a few books under their belt how can they get into that small percentage of the pie uh by selling a lot of books uh, <laughs> or creating the impression uh the, a, a very inviolable impression with the agents and the editors that they will sell a lot of books uh now you can't just say it uh, and sometimes it's just the subject is is great uh sometimes uh the author has such a great standing in in their industry or their community or multiple communities that it's a given that he or she can uh basically bring their personal endowment uh to selling a lot of books uh, sometimes it's because they're rich and they're willing to write a big check to uh, basically use the publisher as a self-publisher. No one would call it that, okay? But that's done a lot. Uh, and what I mean is, okay, you publish me. Well, I'll buy the first 20,000 copies at, a, at my author discount. I'll uh, set aside a, a big budget, to, you know, higher state-of-the-art uh, marketing and uh, people and and that's one way. To, I mean, at the end of the day, it still has to be a quality book. Uh, yes, do not forget that. Because there are a lot of avenues now for authors to get their books out and to get them self-published or um, author services companies. If you're going to go that route, you have to be willing to compete with any book that's out there that's published. Because any publisher, uh, the big five, or any of the other um, still existing independents, they're using these online platforms to sell their books as well. So your book needs to have the quality, the editing, the design work that any of these books have if you hope to compete. Um, and those things can be available if you look and if you do your research and you find um, quality, uh, freelancers or companies that can give you that that teamwork to bring the quality of your book uh, into a competitive state. It's not hopeless. I do think that writers have an advantage now um, with the online um, platform building because people, you can get noticed more quickly and find your audience uh, in ways that Prior, you know, back in the, back in the day, you had to be on a major talk show. You had to be a guest. You had to have, you know, big speaking uh, platform. But now you can, you know, you can use all of these online platforms if you know how to do it. Take them seriously, and it's not just, you know, showing people what you're eating. You know, you can use, you can learn. Um, if I could, you could, um, and you know try to 
try to locate your audience, find out who they are, where they hang out, and get involved in groups on online and you know take your take yourself seriously now another thing that i find when when um when i've been screening or with projects that um the agency represents a book proposal needs structure and a manuscript needs structure and as an editor which i do for for various books as an indie publisher or as just a, an editor, that's the biggest downfall. The person can have great writing talent, but they don't understand structure. So talk a little bit about the structure of a book proposal and how you evaluate it to see if you want to represent something. Well, the first thing, of course, I look for is a title. Uh, and most of the time, the author uh, is too close to the project and too removed uh, from from marketing concepts to have the right title, but that's okay. I'll overlook that initially. Uh, then I go to the overview, and my idea of an, a perfect overview is one that is very crisp, uh, 250 words at the most, one page, one type page, uh, double spaced, uh, just describing as basically as possible what the book is, why it should exist, and what it will do for the reader. Uh, and if you have something special about you that is really significant and that that should go in an overview because it's going to make them go, wow, this this writer has a connection to this story or this this topic, they act because you can immediately see they can access the market. That's the thought behind that overview. Yeah. If you have a valuable hook. Uh, either from a marketing or a concept uh, perspective, uh, plant that in there. Uh, absolutely. It'll be emphasized in more detail later in the proposal. Uh, the second part is, you know, and this can go in various orders, but the second part is a third person biography. And I say third person because you want to write it as if you were applying for a job. It's not a resume. Just write about yourself, but write about yourself in the perspective, in the context of the, the nonfiction book you're exactly. writing. Exactly. What's your relationship? Not that you've won writing awards in third grade. You know, it's like, not that there's anything wrong with that. It's great. But the relationship with what it is you're writing about. Exactly. Great point. Yeah. So if it's a book for lawyers, start talking about that. Uh, and then you can work your way down to more peripheral details. Uh, like, like the fact that you live somewhere with your dogs and, you know, <laughs> I always. Yeah, if you in. like dogs, you know, that's fine. But, a little personal touch is fine, but it should be third person. And you got to remember, not all agents like dogs. No, that's uh, true. I don't um, understand in fact, that. I've never really pulled how many like dogs. We know. should. Yeah, we we'll should. do that in the next okay. edition. Yes. Uh, so anyway, uh, the next section would be uh, who, who the book is for. And this is where you identify the demographics, you really shouldn't have to do any research here. If you are writing about a subject that you're familiar with in any you know fashion, you should just be able to very quickly uh, identify who the various customers or demographics are uh, for this book. But I disagree. Okay, take it. I think nowadays you have no excuse not to fully know your market. You have access to things like keyword research online uh, platforms with articles and questions that people are asking. If you are writing about nonfiction and something where there's a problem that you are solving, you can go and see how many people are searching for that. And you can use those statistics to prove your market. You, you don't have an excuse to say, well, I think all women should read this book. You need to know what about women and which women would need to read your book and what problem does it solve? So use those opportunities in that market section. And if you access a particular group of people, you're in an organization for women who have that problem that you're solving, put that in there. That's the market. And then if there are secondary markets, you can put that in too, but focus on your primary market. And you're right. They shouldn't need to do the research because if they're writing the book, they should already And know. it may be self-evident as far as the agent's concerned. Also, I have to say, 
Uh, I but, like statistics in that section. Uh, don't get lazy with it. Exactly. It, it never hurts. And to you have should too know much. where they are because you're going to need to access them for anyway, your promotion. It come, right. So then the next section is crucial, uh, and that's author marketing. Uh, if if you have a huge platform, uh, this is a very easy section to write. Uh, most of the authors I talk to, like at conferences and so on, they, they don't have a huge platform. They're, they're people. Most of us do not have well, a huge platform. it's good that platform. they're people. Yeah. <laughs> most people don't have huge social platforms, even though they are very uh, uh, capable uh, and very creative and have a great and useful book within them. Uh, so the real, what I find the real creative process here is how to fill this section, even though you don't have what anybody would say is a great platform. Uh, so there's ways to bypass that. And I think that's where your own research is going to come into play. Uh, you have to keep in mind that publishers don't really know very much, especially when it comes to marketing or platforms or digital marketing. They, they they say they do, but they really don't. That's not where their education is, okay? And they're not really paying top dollar to bring in people who have that expertise. They're letting companies like Procter & Gamble get those people. Uh, and they don't want to pay, they don't want to compete for those uh, high six-figure wages. So- Is you, that an ed editorialization? No, no. I think uh, <laughs> if publishers are being honest, they'll, they'll admit that. But they're not going to be, there's no reason for them to have to be that honest. But the advantage for you is, as a writer, is you can actually learn more than they already know. So what I tell people is go look at Amazon. I mean, not, not the uh, catalogs of Amazon, but look at all the different tools, tutorials, many of which are very free. I mean, very free. They're free, okay, or rather low cost. And they'll tell you how to use Amazon, which is 50% of all book sales right now, whether you're talking about uh, traditionally published or self-published, about 50%. So if you learn how to use the Amazon platform, which is perfectly learnable, uh, you'll know more than most publishers already know. And you could then leverage all of that into your marketing plan. Uh, and I think it, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to say, I'm willing to go on talk shows. Uh, I'm willing to, you know, those things are, we just dismiss them. But if you are going to hire a publicist and you really are going to, that can go in your, pro, and I call it promotions, but it is author marketing. I just don't want to confuse um, anyone with markets and then, you know, what you're going to do. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can learn and, and say you'll do and that you will do. Uh, and another important bypass is to, instead of bringing attention to the fact that maybe your platform is weak, you piggyback on platforms that are very strong that you'll be able to access. So if, you're, what, if that begins by knowing the community you're writing for. So if it's uh, an, a, a sales type book and you don't have a, a huge platform in that category, though you have all the expertise, uh, what you have to do is talk about how you are a member and active in these various organizations, which have memberships, paid memberships of uh, six figure, seven figure uh, individuals and conferences and digital, you know, in person and digital and how uh, you are in a position to leverage all of that and to, uh, how you will be, you know, so this, that's be a way creative. to bypass it and bring attention so that you can piggyback existing platforms. So in that uh, example of writing a sales book, books on sales, sales itself as a concept has a tremendous platform. Tens of millions of Americans earn their living in one way or another through sales. And there's lots of organizations and uh, loose associations and social media groups uh, dedicated just to sales and marketing. And you have to bring the attention to that platform, that all that is there. And all you need to do is to be assertive in that process. And they will, they will embrace you because you've got something they want. Well, you know, we don't have that much more time for this. We will be doing a much longer 
um, workshop on this subject um, later in the year. And uh, we can go into more detail about certain things. But I think you've made an excellent point that in, in that you put your heart into your writing, you create a great product, but you, no matter if you get a traditional publisher or not, you need to support your project, know how to promote it and put your heart into that and be creative. Also, um, you're going to need to do uh, in a book proposal, you're going to need to do comparative and competitive titles. So that's something that um, isn't that you want to use to support the existence of your book and find recent books that aren't that even if they're similar, that show that people want to read about your subject. And then you're going to need to do um, a logical outline table of contents of the book because they want to know what they're getting. It's a blueprint. And so uh, any agent or publisher wants to see that you know what your book is and how you're going to execute it and that you'll be able to follow through because you're also they're also looking at you to see if you're a credible writer and, and a professional. So everything you do is going to add to that perception of your professionalism. So is there anything else that would immediately either capture your attention? Well, the or... outline is crucial yeah. also. And that's where you give a description of each of the chapters. And this should not be written like a telegram, whatever that is, a telegram, right? This should not be written <laughs> I don't in a think cryptic anybody way. Knows what that is. It should be written in a way that reflects your writing style and your personality. Uh, and so that the agent and the editor can connect with it as if they're reading the, uh, the actual text in your book. So what you want each of these chapters to do is to show the organization content-wise of the book and also give a very clear example of your ability to tell this information, to share this information. I was told when I was first learning to write and I had some mentors early on that your book proposal almost needs to be better than the ultimate book. I know that sounds kind of funny and, and you want your book to be amazing, but it, when we create an outline in this book, uh, Write the Perfect Book Proposal, it makes it look easy as if you could just like check off each section. Each section is really important and you need to take time and be creative. This is your opportunity. And if you understand how, you know, agents and editors evaluate it, they're looking for some, they're looking to see that you are credible, professional, that you understand what your book is about, that you know your audience, know how to access them, and that you're going to be a, a participant in the success of the book. Yeah, the, the, uh, the proposal in nonfiction writing will be the bridge to the deal. And you want, uh, and you know, you can find a good agent, but they need that book proposal and they're not going to write that for you. They may help you, but you really want to be a team member and a team member is someone that's valued and it's it's going to get the uh, f it, you're going to have the effort and the attention because you're bringing something to the table you're bringing a good idea a good project you've shown you can execute it and you're giving your agent a tool that he or she can use because they can access anybody if they're a good agent they can access the right editor at the right publishing house but that proposal and concept is what's going to close the deal and leverage an, an advance. I agree. Do I agree? <laughs> Should we agree? We agree. Well, uh, we hope if there's any questions, you know, we will be doing a longer version of this and uh, talking about the various ways you can build a build a platform, how you can write a great book, how you can think about what you want to write about um, and how to market yourself. But for now, understand that this is a very subjective business and agents, you know, they, they, they help you, but they don't actually work for you. So, you know, you want to, 
Explain you, that. You work well. Uh, the <laughs> agent has to massage their relationships with the publishers and the editors. Yeah. Uh, you may be, uh, clients sort of come and go a lot of the time, but uh, the publishers don't go. They're always there. So you got to remember, and the agent is focused on his or her commission. So uh, the agent needs to monetize everything they're doing and they can't burn bridges on the supply side, which to them is the, their customer base, which their customer base isn't so much the authors as much as it is the editors and the publishers. That said, their, their inventory, their product is only as good as the people they're representing. And agents also will help you get the best deal. They will negotiate on your behalf and they can uh, bring in the intangibles. So work hard because this is your opportunity. It, writing is great. Writing, you know, I, I've just done a book called Writing is uh, Spiritual Writing. So, you know, writing can be its journey in itself, but there's a path from writing to publishing and you can't skimp on any of these steps if you want to be a, a writer who is also published. And that's, I think, all the advice that Jeff and Deborah Herman have for you today. 